Welcome to the Ian Bowsfield Experience. I'm glad you're here. This series of podcasts are just things that come up in my mind when I'm thinking about playing, when I'm thinking about teaching, and general thoughts about music. There are some things here that I hope you'll find really useful. And don't forget, if you've got any comments or if there's anything you want to discuss further, go to ianbowsfield.com. Hello, everybody. I'm back. And before we plough into this mixed bag podcast, I'd like to bring to your attention that on the 6th of March, in the Early Music Centre in York, I'm going to be doing a recital with Alison Proctor to raise awareness of and to raise money for the York Music Hub. Now, before um, this health issue over the last couple of years happened, I was made patron of the York Music Hub and it was something that I was incredibly proud of and something that I was really looking forward to getting my teeth in to be really active and do something for the young people in York. But of course, we've all been tripped up. Well, we're back. It's up and running and it's something I'm really looking forward to dedicating my time to. Um, so, Early Music Centre, York, 6.30pm on the 6th of March. Be there. All my Facebook friends, I know where you live. I know you can be there. Get yourselves there. It's going to be a great concert and it'd be lovely to see you all again. If you can't get there, take a look at the York Music Hub and see what these wonderful people are doing for the youth of York. Now, I don't need to tell you how important education and instrumental education is for young people, whether they become musicians or not. Learning to set goals, discipline, problem solving, learning to live with and interact with other people, thinking on your feet, all of the things that you need in other aspects of your life, you can develop playing a musical instrument. We all know that because we did it. Um, one thing that um, when I talked with Vicky Yanula about what the priorities were, because I'm, I'm talking to sponsors to try and get money, and I have to say, I, I had a a tear in my eyes. I was struggling a little bit because she mentioned to me a school in York um, with several hundred students, 43 of which, without to put it too bluntly, are being fed by the state. They're in poverty. Sorry, meant to say 43% of them in this, in this city centre. There are lots of kids in poverty. How the heck are they going to afford musical instrument lessons? Where are they going to get an instrument from? And that's where we come in. We, the big plural we, you and me. We have to help these people. And I was kind of tearful because I was one of those kids. And I got help from that time much more from the government than it's kind of like music services have deteriorated so much in the UK since then. I got a state provided instrument. I got my lessons paid for. And I'm really hoping that my first teacher, Graham Walker, who gave me my first lesson when I was seven years old, will be at that concert on the 6th of March as well to pay tribute to him and thank him. So there's a school in the centre of your... 43% of the kids are being paid. You know, they're being paid to, to eat by the government. They can't support themselves. So this is why I'm in it. I want to get bursaries for these kids to give them the chance, the same chance that I had. So... I'm going to be knocking on a business door close to you. And if you feel like you can do anything to help um, in any way, however big or small, please look at the website. And 6th of March, I'll see you there. I try not to look at social media very much these days um, for many multitudinous reasons, some of which would probably get me in trouble. So I'm not going to go into it. Um, but I recently looked and I uh, saw... And a most indignant post about somebody came to me and said, did you hear this recording of so-and-so playing? Wasn't it amazing? And I was really upset about it because you could tell it was just all stitched together and it was nothing genuine. Blah, 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 you know, it wasn't photoshopped recording, in other words. Mass indignation spliced together and cut and enhanced and all of the rest of it. And... Uh, it kind of amused me. I, I thought, well, yeah, actually, yeah, quite funny. And then it occurred to me, uh, there'll be a few people around the world biting their fingernails that this pandemic is ending because they're going to get invited to do concerts and they're going to be expected to do what they've just been doing online. 
<laughs> anyway, you can work out who they might be. Um, I have to say, I have heard things over the last couple of years that have quite definitely been what I would call photoshopped recordings um, on social media that I think have been absolutely bloody marvellous. I think they've been wonderful. And I don't care whether they've been chopped up and they sort of like the combined effort of 58 takes and, you know, 200 splices or whatever. I loved it. It's great to hear some of the stuff that's been happening online. And um, I guess as the author of this post said, you know, as long as you realise it's not for real, that's okay. And then he made me think, how long have recordings actually been? Is it since they were for real? I mean, this is just a more technically advanced version of what's been going on now for decades and decades. In fact, the amazing Hiroshi Isaka, the producer of Camerata Records, with whom I've done a couple of quite splendid recordings over the years, he said that when he retired, he was going to re release an album. Remember what they used to be. An album called Sorry. Because he was just going to put on, sorry, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, oh, sorry, sorry, oh, sorry. From all of the um, uh, outtakes, should we say. So this phenomenon of enhancing recordings is by no means new. I have a, a recording out that I think I did in 1990 or 1991, the first one, you know, like when I had like like, like a mullet hair cut and a moustache, embarrassingly. Um, and um, by the way, for any of you who have that, that uh, album, and it's not just a bootleg copy, um, that picture on the front of it, I actually had my hair cut for that. I actually had a good three or four inches taken off it for that. Um, but there's a track on that. There's a bark thing on that. And I, I reckon there might be... <laughs> there might be about two bars in it, two measures in it that I did in one go. <laughs> so it's in by no, by no means new. I have never performed that piece in public. Um, so we've been cutting and editing, going back to, you know, the... The 50s and 60s with recording engineers sitting in a recording studio surrounded by bits of tape and then they're sellotaping stuff together. So it is by no means uh, a new thing. We've all done it. Um, and, you know, I think, I think we need to... Someone once described themselves, a brass player to me, as a recording artist. And I think as long as we realise that even recordings that are called live recordings are not necessarily live. Um, there are some I've seen, I've played on a lot of orchestral recordings, it's called a live recording. And they recorded most of the last rehearsal and did some retakes afterwards. So, um, yeah, but it still will be interesting. Let's hold these internet superstars to their word. Let's get them doing concerts and let's hear them doing it live. It's all in your mind. Or so the doctors tell me when they can't work out what's wrong with me. But if the mind is so powerful, why don't they tell us to make ourselves better with our mind? Maybe we could do that. And joking aside, I've got a couple of um, examples here of just how powerful the mind can be in music and in brass playing. I'd like to give you two cases um, of, of brass players. One was my best friend, and the other um, will remain anonymous. Rod Franks was one of the two first trumpet players in the London Symphony. He was my best friend for um, 12 years. I pretty much had breakfast, lunch, and evening meal with him. Certainly when we were on tour and when we had rehearsals. We were joined at the hip. We were like brothers. I knew exactly when he was going to play. I loved working with him. We're both Yorkshiremen. We were. He was a Yorkshireman. And, um, yeah, I miss him. He, he's no longer with us. Um, there, were him, there was him and, and, a, and, a, and uh, my other friend, Jim Watson. And if I needed advice, 
I'm trying to work out how to say this without having to put any bleeps in the recording. If I call them up for any advice, oh, so, so-and-so's done this, and what do you think, what should I do? And they both say the same thing independently. They both either say, um, bugger them, basically, forget it. Um, and uh, all they'd say, uh, oh, you want to be careful there, you want to watch out, a bit dangerous. So they were always my sounding boards. They're sadly no longer with us. Uh, Rod Franks, um, he had like a brain tumour he had removed and he went deaf in one ear and then he got epilepsy. And then this was over a period of 10 years. And then one day he played the beginning of Marla 5 for me and uh, it sounded great. He said, can you hear a bit of air coming out of the corner of my lip there? I said, well, a bit, I suppose he said, yeah, I had a stroke three days ago. So you had a stroke three, what are you doing? No, it's all right, it still works. Shortly after that, he had a road traffic accident and that was the end of it. Um, I think whoever it was upstairs had decided this time you're not getting away with it. And I miss him. But that's, so he had all of those health issues. And even said, I had a stroke three days, three days ago and he's still playing fine. And um, I was with a friend recently and I asked about the well-being of a very prominent trombone player. And he said, well, you know, he had a triple heart bypass operation. And um, and while he was on the operating table, he, he had a stroke. And so he's finding it a bit difficult to walk and, and talking is not so easy. Um, but he's getting there. I said, well, what about his playing? He said, oh, that's fine. <laughs> the guy's having trouble talking and walking. But he's playing, it's fine. And so let's look at those two things from a pedagogical point of view. So there's Rod, who, you know, um, you know, he'd had all this, he was deaf, he had epilepsy, you know, he'd had a stroke. And this other amazing trombone player, who same scenario, heart problems, stroke, pick up the instrument and it works. What does that show us? What does that teach us about the power of the human mind? And what are we doing as teachers? When we tell people you stand like this, you hold it like this, you do this with your tongue. Well, actually, I don't do this, but you know, a lot of teachers do. You've got to do this with the tongue. You've got to do this with the air. You've got to breathe like this. You've got, you know, you've got to articulate like that. You know, and you do this with your lips. When you've got those two, albeit extraordinary players, being able to overcome, even in the case of a, of, of a moderate disability, to play still, to, to play beautifully, is absolutely incredible. So when we're in the practice room, when we're in the teaching studio, remembering the power of the human imagination and the power and the strength of the human will to do what we want to do overcomes any physicality that we might have in our technical issues if we choose to allow that to happen. Where I work in Switzerland, Quite a hot subject at the moment is feedback. Feedback after exams from experts or feedback in general. Should we be giving it? Um, I guess everything we ever do in life gives feedback. I'm speaking now and there will be sound feeding back, bouncing off the wall in front of me. So everything involves some form of feedback. Um, Actually, on that subject, I, heard, I saw a wonderful documentary um, about this Irish missionary who finished up, as bizarre things do seem to happen in life, as being the coach of the Ethiopian um, marathon team, marathon running, you know, program, and has been for like 40 years. And there's this little Irish guy surrounded by these unbelievable athletes, I mean, Come on, they've, they've won all of the medals for, for decades. And rightly so. And he was asked about how you deal with particularly failure. And he said, well, you remember so-and-so. Um, at the last Olympics was due to, due to win it by a long way. And he finished fourth. And don't know what happened, he, just, he finished fourth. And he said, in a situation like that, 
you should never speak to someone immediately afterwards. You need to leave them. You need to leave them time just to calm down and, you know, collect their thoughts. And he said, even though I had quite a prominent position within his life, it was not for me to open up the subject of what went wrong. You always have to sit and wait. And he said, it's usually, in my experience, within six and eight weeks that they come and see you and say, can I talk to you about what happened? Can you help me work through it? So I guess, you know, that's our role as mentors, as friends, as colleagues, you know, is to try and create an environment to create a relationship with um, people where they feel safe, secure to discuss these sometimes failures, as, as we all do, that they feel safe to discuss, discuss that. And then you have to choose your words as carefully as possible to see how you can help that person build and move forward. Now, that's just a bit of an aside. That's not what I was, um, that's not what I was intending to talk to you about. This is, um, this was something that was mentioned to me by, first by Rex Martin, who put it beautifully because he was getting very angry with people who were giving opinion as fact. And I needed a few weeks, I guess, to let that settle and, and to see what opinion as fact really means. So I'd like to look at that just briefly here, because I think we have an obligation, I think, to our students. I feel sorry for them sometimes. They go and take auditions places. And they make the mistake of going for feedback sometimes. And um, depending where you get the feedback, it can be a wonderful learning experience or it can be a little bit damaging. And, um, and uh, you know, one rough rule of thumb there is never go and uh, get feedback from someone you wouldn't take, you know, advice from in a lesson. Um, but again, I digress. Very often they will go for feedback after an audition and someone will say, your right of the Valkyries was wrong. It should have been like this. This accent was not big enough. This tempo was wrong. And what you mean there, dear colleague, is you prefer it like that because there are very few definites in music. If someone plays the wrong articulation, if someone plays the wrong rhythm, but statements like, we all know that the ride of the Valkyries goes like this, and that also happens when you go for lessons with people, and they say, I want to go for a lesson with so-and-so who's going to teach me how the Mozart record goes. Well, 99 times out of 100, that person's going to tell you how they like it. They're not going to tell you how it goes, because we don't know how it goes. It goes basically however the conductor decides it's going to go. Um, we are only a conduit. We are only a small jigsaw piece. And so people will give their opinion as if it's fact. And I say right of the Valkyries because that's one of the most um, umstritten, disputed of the excerpts. I'm sure Wagner invented that one just to get trombone players fighting for the next couple of hundred years. Now, in my last year in the Vienna Philharmonic, I played the Die Valkyrie three times with Lauren Mazel, who wanted dun dun ta dum tim pam dun ta dum tim pam really long and heavy at the end, and with Christian Thielemann, who wanted dun dun ta dum tim pam tim pa dum tim pam pam big crescendo on the last beat of the measure. And with Franz Welsemurst, who wanted I'm assuming none of those, well, Lauren, Lauren couldn't listen to it. I'm assuming the other two don't listen to this podcast, so they can't listen to it and, and, and shout at me for getting it wrong. But um, as far as I remember, that's how it went. So that's, that was in, I think, over literally over six months. So if someone gives their opinion as to how it goes. I think you have to be very clear. In my opinion, I like it like, it sounds good like. We need to be careful. We can confuse these 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 sort of young talents very easily by saying, I mean, I've heard people say, we all know this is the tempo for Zarathustra. Really? No. Old chap, you've probably only played it once and that's the tempo that the conductor of your orchestra took it at. 
I've played it 50 times, all slightly in a different tempo. So please have a think about that. Be careful when you're teaching to you give your opinion by all means. That's what we're there to do. But don't give opinion as fact. Back to more light-hearted stuff. Um, Ingrid van Oosterhout. Sorry, Ingrid. It, that's the best I could do. It's probably very wrong, isn't it, that pronunciation? Um, who is a bit of a fan of the podcast, listens quite a lot. Thank you very much. She's wrote me a while ago. She wrote me um, some, some questions. Um, she said that she had a great weekend because the sun was shining. And, uh, and she had a great weekend because um, her son um, played in the concert bar. It's a very talented young bass drum mom player. Fantastic. She listened to a couple of my podcasts, liked them, good. And she wanted, it made her think about taking a practice routine a bit more serious. Um, <laughs> following one of the most recent podcasts, question number one, what can I do to hate scales a bit less? I like the wording of that. What can I do to hate them less? <laughs> I laughed about this, Ingrid, and then uh, then thought, "Hang on, that's a that's a, a good that's a good question." Well, of course, there's two ways of of learning scales. Um, I've got a little nine year old boy who plays the trombone, and um, I basically taught him a tune, and it was the tune of a major scale. And then he starts that major scale on any note. If it was written down, he'd have no idea how to play it. Um, but I guess that's not that important at the moment. That's one way of learning, and that's kind of how I did it as well. I have to stop and ask. I guess I would have to stop and ask myself what each individual note was, um, um, because I just learned them all as tunes. And then there's, of course, the other way of learning them, and the other way of seeing the notes, you know, on the page, or saying the notes out loud and knowing the probably knowing the tonality and knowing at which part of the scale you're on is probably the best way of doing it. But those more intuitive types like me. And we'll just remember a tune. Okay, but that wasn't the question. How can you feel that you hate scales a bit less? Well, okay. I guess if you realize that every scale, Ingrid, has its own sound world. Every scale has its own emotion. There's a reason why um, composers write symphonies in D minor, in E major. In C major, they 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 have chosen to write that piece of music in that key. It was not just random. They didn't just do it in, you know, C major because they didn't have to write so many accidentals in and stuff. <laughs> Easier to write the C, the key signature. Out. You know, it's like they have a certain sound. They have a certain emotion. So that's what I do when I practice scales, and I do practice scales, as you all know is I get into the sound world of that tonality and then the intonation all of a sudden is comes automatically because he's part of this tune and part of this sound world. So that's what I do. And then once you start seeing the emotion of a scale, you start to see the emotion of that tonality in a piece of music. So that's how I, that, that's the best I can do, Ingrid, I'm afraid. That's, that, it's probably not very good but right now. Is there a practice mute in the world that doesn't kill your attack? I practice a lot with a mute because I don't want to wake the neighbours. What time do you practice? And it sounds and feels okay until I take the damn thing off. Yeah, I, I am not a big fan of practice mutes, I have to say. Um... I used to think they were useful for some things and useful in an emergency. I now don't even think that. Um, Ingrid, if I, if, if I play on a practice mute, in fact, I'm, I'm looking at one here, one of those little silver Japanese ones. Um, if I use one of those for 20 minutes, I'm not in the center of the sound the whole of the next day. It's really, really difficult. It really takes me out of the center. Um, and because the resistance is so different and are there any that don't mess you up um no i haven't found one they're either too loud and don't mess you up so much 
in which case your neighbours are still going to hear you. Or they're really quiet, quiet and they mess you up a heck of a lot. So, um, no. You know what, Ingrid, this is no solution for you because long term is not great. But given the choice between a practice mute and doing mouthpiece practice, I'm happier just doing mouthpiece practice. That's my strategy now. If it's like, okay, I arrive really late into a hotel room. Remember back in the old days when we used to tour. Actually, maybe we will again soon. Um, you know, and I've got, you know, I want to do 20 minutes practice or whatever. I'll probably just put the television on and do 20 minutes with a mouthpiece or something like that. Um, and I find that disrupts me less. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, why don't you take a bottle of champagne around to your neighbours? Or maybe don't practice when they're sleeping. Are they nocturnal or something? Oh, maybe they are. You never know, do you? You never know. You know that story about a butterfly flapping its wings on one side of the world and there's a tornado sometime later on the other side of the world. Well, I kind of saw this in our environment recently. <laughs> when I went to the Vienna Philharmonic, uh, 22 years ago, the president of the orchestra said, you know, was asking about the difference between life in London and, and Vienna, you know, and I said, well, basically in Vienna you have one and in London you don't, you just work um, and uh, kind of thing. And um, although that said, I do miss it a bit, um, a bit. And he, I, he said, was there anything we did in London that I thought we could bring to Vienna? And I said, well, look, you got to work with John Williams. you got to bring John Williams in. Ooh, ooh, film composer. Hmm, oh, a bit tricky. Hmm, a bit out there. Film composer. And um, I said, yeah, he's going to fall in love with this string sound. You know, it's just going to be incredible. And uh, 21 years later, it happened. <laughs> I'm sorry I wasn't there to... To see it come to fulfilment, but but uh, that was the. You know, I said you gotta get him in. It's gonna be amazing, you know. And I think the orchestra and conductor have fallen in love with each other as they should. Um, and then the the vice president, I was talking to him, said, "Yeah, what? Do you have any suggestions?" I said, "Well, you know," he said, "We're losing our audience. You know, we need to appeal to the younger people." And um, I said, "Well, you could. Uh, why don't you bring some? Why don't you bring a pop musician in? Ooh, pop musician." Oh, do some pop music. I said, look, the San Francisco Symphony has just done um, um, just done a, a concert with Metallica, that now legendary album. And um, I said, you know, we, why don't you get Metallica in to do a stadium concert with the Vienna Philharmonic? It'd be amazing. Ah, good idea. I'll look into this. And then he came to see me and he said, Ian, he used to call me Ian. We've been considering this. We think it's a very good idea. So we've invited Bobby McFerrin to come and sing Don't Worry, Be Happy. I tried. <laughs> so there you go. There's a rambling podcast with lots of different things. I just wanted to reach out and let you know I'm still here. So there you go. I hope you enjoyed that. If there are any issues that you found particularly interesting, don't forget to contact me. And always go to uh, ianbowsfield.com for lots more interesting stuff.